it was the first time in my life I completely surrendered without having the idea of an outcome. How do you prepare for something like an amputation? Well, hello, everybody. Dr. Ron Oberstein uh, with you at another edition of our Life West Leadership Line. I am so excited today. I've got a dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Liz Anderson Peacock. Hi, Liz. Hello. <laughs> She's coming to us from Barrie, Ontario. Let me tell you a little bit about Liz. And, and just so uh, if you haven't seen Liz speak, you will be seeing her speak. She'll be at the Wave uh, this August 5th and 6th at Life West. Make sure you make it to the Wave because Liz will be there and it's going to be a phenomenal event. Um, but I just want to share with you a little about Liz and and her uh, just just her travels in chiropractic. You know, um, she graduated in 1986 from Canadian Memorial College in uh, Toronto, hung out in Toronto for a couple of years as an associate and then uh, hightailed it up to Barrie and started her own practice. Uh, you know, three decades of uh, uh, being in uh, Barrie, Ontario, and uh, has a big following there. Uh, right now, she specializes in, uh, in uh, pediatric and very, very difficult cases. Um, it's one of her specialties, and she's phenomenal at it. Uh, her resume uh, would show, or her curriculum vitae would show, that she sat on, been involved in numerous organizations in the States and up in Canada. She sat on regulatory boards. Um, she was, uh, uh, she was, I believe, uh, Vice President of the College of uh, Chiropractic in Ontario. Uh, for those of you in the lower 48, that's kind of like our state board. Uh, that's the regulatory agency for all of Ontario. Um, taught for the ICPA and is truly uh, someone that I can say uh, knows how to give, do, love, and serve out of, their, out of their abundance, out of her abundance, and never expects anything in return. And she is someone who is just so plugged into something. We're going to find out about it today, Liz, but some kind of cosmos that's that that that's just moving through her that you will get this. And we're going to dive into some good conversation. So Liz, pleasure. Really, it's a pleasure to have you. Well, Ron, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. <laughs> well, it wasn't as last night. Liz was actually on a call with me last night, right? We spoke to the yeah. heel chiropractor. That was like my obituary, you know, when they introduced me, you know? I mean, it was great. You know, I was like, man, I did that and this and that. I was like, wow. But boom, let's talk, man. Let's get into this thing and really start speaking. And, you know, I have to tell you and, and, and for our audience to know that every time I hear you speak and we've had you at the wave and, you know, you've been at, we've all, we've been at places in Europe together and, you know, lecturing on the same platforms. And, you know, I, you just, I just feel like one of the messages, the under core messages is always about possibility, mm. opening up possibility. Right. You know, and, and just share with us, like, you know, let's talk about that and just kind of jump into that. Sure. Well, um, you know, we are, we're spirits in a material world. And I think that uh, one of the things that the last two years has reminded me of is how you can have similar or people going through same environments, but have completely different responses to the environments, which has to do with the interpretation of the environment as being hostile or as being confusing or perhaps being uh, possible to be in a different mindset. And I think that um, I'm constantly reminded that also by observing patients, ones that are in fear, they've got calcified thinking affecting their physical body. And those that are in that place of possibility that just need some nuances and just some fine tuning to help them through that next piece. Yeah. And you know what, when you talked about that, what I'm hearing also just kind of pulls up for me is the word coherence. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, yeah. It just sounds like that. You know, when we talk about coherence and we talk about, you know, all the things that, you know, how we adapt to our environment and how we, you know, the stressors in life, you know, it's so, it's so true, but what do you see? Like, like, you know, I, well, I guess, I guess the question I have for you is, you know, you've mentioned patients, right? So, you know, how do we, how do we gauge that or, or what are some of the messages that you have around that? So I think really what I look at is nuances in communication. And first of all, it's about being absolutely present. So you can pick up 
the body language or a delay in a reply where they're thinking about something. And those are the ones that make me curious on, oh, what were you about to say there? And often people will discount what they were going to say. And often when you can bring that out of them, that's like the missing puzzle, the little missing piece. And I think that um, the nuance in our communication is, uh, in, and when, when I say communication, I mean in observation, in palpation, in the physical, the, the verbal word, and the way that we can draw things out and even asking the right questions of people where they have an aha moment, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's really, you know, nuanced communication doesn't get rewarded. What, what's getting rewarded these days is, you know, that very fast binary, you're either in this box or this box, and then we're going to treat you in this box, or you were going to treat you like this kind of an individual or this kind of a nationality or whatever it might be. So I think that that is... Um, really a key piece that I've really reflected on is the nuance, right? And that is, that it really helps us kind of solve puzzles. Yeah. And when you, when you talk about the nuances, you know, D.D. Palmer said how, you know, whatever percentage, the high percentage of subluxation, I don't want to quote D.D. because people have misquoted him. Um, but, you know, the, the greater majority of subluxations are caused through emotional you know, emotional trauma. Right. And and we can pick up those nuances a lot of times through that. Right. I, I love what you said about that, you know, about putting people in boxes. Right. It's. Yeah. I mean, yep. we, we slap a label on them, then we treat according to the label or. And, and again, then we we move the possibility that's there for them. And, you know, I'm often reminded that don't rid people of their experience. Mm -hmm. uh, if anything, you want to acknowledge their experience and then become curious to ask them new questions that hopefully open up that, uh, that thinking, that mindset for them into something that's more possible than where they were. Plus, it also creates an opportunity for a new future versus taking them back to where they were. Right. Which may not have been so good. In the first exactly. Well, that, yeah, exactly. And, you know, what's so cool about it is that is that I mean, let's face it, you know, everybody, you know, there's not I don't think there's anyone excluded. We, we live our story. Right. You know, you know, we all have a story or stories. Right. And we're all going to be writing new chapters, you know, into our story. And, you know, until we catch ourselves going, that's just my story, you know, like. Like, really, what is it? You know, because we cover ourselves up by our stories a lot of times. But when we're dealing with people on our table or people in our room or people who we're having a consult with, you know, it's like their story is one thing. And it's when, you know, their story is their symptom. Right. And when you get behind that story or allow them to, to you ask the right questions, allow them to move behind that story. And the next thing you know, you know, they're really uncovering where that subluxation is. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right, too, that the story is about the past, that they're reliving in the present, but then they want a different future. So then we can't keep telling ourselves the same story because we're going to keep recreating where we are now. That's and that's sort of that piece that when they can get that aha moment. And when I check in with myself and do that, too, as you said, we're writing our own stories. We put ourselves in a placement box on this is my box. And all of a sudden it's like, why do I believe that? Where, where did that one come from? Or I've been directed by a narrative of, you know, taking a side or a stance and, and then you identify with that, right? And then it's like, well, why do I have to identify with that? Why does it have to be A or B? Right. It could be infinite, right? Oh, oh yeah. And, and the question that I always have is, why do I have to identify with anything? Exactly. Like, like, you know, and the truth is, is our world is built up with identity. In fact, I think that's probably one of the biggest subluxations on the planet today. You know, people identifying and then people saying, you're not seeing me. Right. And I get it. I get the not seeing. I'm not seeing also. But but it's like, you know, we we hold on to our identity so tightly. And 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 yet it's we forget, you know, from the from the what we are and who we are. Yeah. So true. You know what I am. You know, I am a father. I am a, a doctor. I am a president of a chiropractor. All these things. But that's not who I am. You right. Know, 
I mean, who you I know, am. I, re I, I really struggled with that when I um, had my uh, my surgery with my amputation and I was not in practice for, well, a very short period of time. But still, it, I had rolled up my identity and what I did so much that if I wasn't practicing, then what what uh, what was I? And it was one of my dear friends who isn't practicing now and is involved in in uh, teaching in the profession. And um and he said, so would you say that I am no, I am less of a chiropractor because I'm not? And I went, oh, my gosh, you're right. So, you know, again, I put myself, I placed myself in a box on this is this is what I do, but it's not who I am. Yeah. And, and society does that, right? You yeah. Know, you know, absolutely. You know, you know, who are you? Oh, I used to be an engineer <laughs> or I used to practice chiropractic. Now, I well, that's not it's just it really is incredible, you know, and, and you talked about, you know, your amputation, you know, and maybe a lot of our viewers who don't know you don't realize that you went through, you know, an experience that you were. I guess that's really about the possibilities. I mean, how I see you, it's not, I don't hold you as this person who had an amputation. I hold you as this person who had something dealt to you that you just flourished with, you know, and I don't, and I'm not saying, that, I'm, I'm, please, I, I hope I'm not saying that it was all rosy and, you know, <laughs> and, you know, daffodils and, you know, and, and unicorns. I know that there was probably a lot of, a lot of other emotions mixed in there, but I mean, you just kind of, Share with, the, share with the audience a little bit, just a little bit about that. Well, you know, for me, it was actually the most remarkable experience. Um, and I think for me, the what it came down to was it was the first time in my life I completely surrendered without having the idea of an outcome. So this whole idea of possibility was absolutely there because how do you prepare for something like an amputation on the other side of it? You really don't know. And even with the information I had received from the surgeon and through, you know, healthcare providers, uh, the, my experience was completely different from what they had said it would be like. And, you know, some things are minimized, some things are maximized. It, my experience was very, very different. So, for me, it was letting go and uh, surrendering to being present in the moment. And I really took that time to deal, to not deal, to be present in whatever was coming up for me and just letting it roll off. And I would say that, you know, from my before to my after, I would do it absolutely all again. Yeah. I would do every single thing all again, because it, was such an amazing experience, which That's sounds really weird. That's so cool. And, and, you know, and the question I have for you is this, like, you know, what were like the, if I could ask you this, what were the top three, like negative thoughts that creeped in or, or limiting thoughts, not just negative, yeah. but limiting thoughts that creeped in. So I didn't have limiting thoughts at all because I, my world was in possibility and I'd already seen myself doing things like paddle boarding, going back to scuba diving, going back running. I'd seen all of that. My limiting thought was actually, I would say it was embedded when I was in the amputee hospital because they have you focusing so much on not falling that you think of falling all the time, right? So everything is mitigating not to fall. And I remembered when I came in, I had two, two things in my home coming in from outside. It was December and I have to get over this little lip in the door and it's an awkward kind of shape. And I remembered thinking with my walker, because I don't have a prosthetic yet, I have to hop over this ledge and this door which swings closed and i'm thinking i'm gonna fall and i i stopped right and i got really scared mm -hmm. and i remember thinking it was like having a metacognition moment because it was like me looking at me in that situation and my higher self was saying liz you better figure this out pretty quick because if this is an issue you're gonna have big issues from here forward so I thought, okay, what do I need to do? And I was like, okay, my husband, Barry, stand behind me. If I fall backwards, you're there. Put the walker over the other side and said, I just have to do it. Just take okay. the step, just take the jump. So I did the jump and then I started laughing because it was so ridiculously easy. And I mean, it's so relevant to so many people that don't take that next step in life. And when they finally do, it's like, oh, yeah. why didn't I do that earlier? Exactly. So it, but that's like a great metaphor, right? I mean, what? But yours was in real life. It's kind of like seeing that that hump is being this huge freaking thing right and then boom you know 
Yeah. And, you know, the universe paths the way for us when we let go. Right. (laughs) And we just have ease with it. And so it's so relevant with respect to practice on, you know, for students being scared to take that first adjustment or being, you know, second guessing yourself. And there's nothing wrong with second guessing yourself. You have those conversations, but eventually you need to take a step. And I think that you the, the key is to follow what your heart is telling you. That, to me, has always been keeping my center is when I follow my heart, things go fine. If I don't follow my heart and I go just with my head, nah, it doesn't always work out the way I had anticipated. Yeah. But Liz, you know what? That's, you know, I mean, we've always talked about that's inside out living, right? You know, it's like it's like really being inner directed. And, and being able just to focus from the inside out, right? Where you're not getting all this stuff coming in, right? I mean, I want to say that we, our, our society has probably taken, um, you know, probably a thousand steps backwards if they normally take one, you know, with all the outside and information we've been given over these last few years. And, and even before that, even just with more news channels, with more social media, with more of the bits of information, and, and does it take us further from our heart, or does it pull us closer to our heart, you know? And it sounds like with your experience, with your with your amputation, that it brought you more into your heart. It brought you more centered, right? Um, Absolutely. You no, know, and that's and that's that's the joy. I mean, it, well, anything that can happen, you know, that can bring us more internal, right? Babies, grandkids, whatever, you know, those simple puppies, whatever it is, to to bring us more. But I want to touch on something that you said because. You know, it's something that Mary and I have talked about, and we we pretty much, you know, tried to raise our kids like this. And um, just talking about words, you know, like like w- like when you got you got you have a two year old, right? And and as you speak words, and you go, "Don't touch that plug." And what our mind hears, you know, our mind takes words and sees pictures, right? Yeah. And there's no picture for "don't." So what they actually hear is touch the plug, touch the socket. Don't touch that socket, touch the socket. So that, that's why they walk up. Instead of saying, if you touch that socket, it could blow you across the room. Now their visual is very different, correct? But I say that because, you know, when you, when, like when you were doing your rehab and they were saying, okay, now don't fall. You can't see the word don't. So the, what resonates is the fall. And that's what we focus on, Right. Absolutely. But patients do the same thing, right? Don't we, you know, and that's, I think, when we tie it back into what you talked about with the nuances of listening, it's also what we're saying too, right? Absolutely. I mean, I have a client right now who's got some really serious, serious things going on. And what I'm having them do is keep a diary of what little things they're noticing as an improvement, no matter how minute, so that all of a sudden, if you can hear yourself saying an H or a B or a T, I want you to note that and celebrate that because you're absolutely right, Ron. We focus on the negative, which creates more of that, or we focus on the the don't think of the red car, <laughs> and you've right. got the picture as to the your red point. Car, yeah. And it's something I've done for a very long time with clients is is moving them in possibility and thinking. And, you know, I think that the easiest way I can describe it is literally what I say to patients. I say, unfortunately, I have to ask you some of these questions to have an understanding of what's going on. That's where you are right now and where you've been, but it doesn't mean that's where you need to be. And where we want to be is focusing on new things. So if I keep saying, how's your pain today? Rank your pain today. Describe your pain today. What are we focusing on? What do you want? Oh, I want health. Okay, so what is health? Get them to define health. Bring it in physically, mentally, spiritually, you know, all through the different determinants of health. Now, what can you do? What can you now notice you can do that you couldn't do before? And let's celebrate that so that you upregulate. That helps helps my work. That helps your body heal, moves you in a direction of your preferred future, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's the same, yeah, anyway, the same yeah. thing. And like you said, you know, I mean, and I don't know where this came from, but the pain scales and all that stuff, why don't we have health scale? This is what I tell our students. I mean, instead of asking, you know, how much pain are you in or, or rate yourself on your pain, rate yourself on your health. Exactly. Oh, you were a seven and now you're an eight. Let's celebrate, you know, yeah. and, and really it's just that simple focus of where we're looking at, right. You know, and, and having them look toward, am I looking toward health, you know, moving toward health or moving away 
from pain, right? And there's right. a whole, and, and that, that chasm is very wide. You know, when we talk about you know, moving away from pain, then you got this huge chasm and you talk about moving toward health, totally different paradigms. Absolutely. Pathogenic versus salutogenic. And, you know, it's those little simple choices over time that build momentum that move you in a different direction. Yeah. Yeah. You also talked about labeling, you know, and I, and, and, and I want, and I love when you talked about, you know, letters and things, we're going to get into alphabet soup in a second, but you also talked about labeling, you know, and, and how many times do we, do we have a, a parent come in, you know, you take care of, you know, chill pediatrics and you've got really, you know, just wild cases that you specialize in, right? Very, and, you know, parent comes in and, the, and you hear their story or their labels of the child, you know, and people don't even realize that children will always play to the expectation of their parents. So if I walk in and say, oh, my daughter, oh, she's not going to talk to you. She's really shy. And, the more, and I, that's my story. And she hears my story and she plays to my expectation. So she plays shy. But when she goes home, she's not shy. You know, it's so it's just so interesting or oh, my boys, they're crazy. You know, they're 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 just banshees. It's like they play to these expectations. And yet we set these up by putting people in a box. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's always been asthma. Oh, it's genetic. That's the big one. Right. It's genetic. Yeah. I, I like to call it the, the what if. Right. Is yeah. that what if they're not? What if they're more? What if they're more creative and resourceful than they've been led to believe? What if you're more creative and resourceful than you've been led to believe? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I love to play that what if game that, again, helps to reduce the, the, the distinctive box that people have been put in, the judgment or the label or the diagnosis or the this is the way I am, you know, or as you said, this is my it's due to my genes. Right. And uh, so. Yeah, it's, it's moving beyond those labels. Absolutely. Before we move out of the nuances and before we move out of the, you know, out of the conversation that we have with people, give, us, give our audience a couple of things that they can either think about or look at or even ask what kind of questions can they ask to kind of break down some of those, uh, some of those barriers or open up, get the people to be able to go beyond their story and move into who they are. <laughs> So I, I think, it, you know, it, it really depends on who you're speaking to in that moment. And I'm just going to say that, that the right question will come when you're present in that moment, if you're curious, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's really the cool piece is you need to attach it to something that's important to the patient on, you know, for example, so let's say you have someone that is acute is what is this telling you about your life? Or is this telling you something about your life? And then we just zip it and it's their story to tell. But then, you know, that might give us some more hints on another question to ask in the future. And I think that, again, the, the idea of don't, ridding, don't rid people of their experience, don't try to fix them, right? And that's how we're trained in traditionally is to fix them versus encouraging and coaching and and holding their hand in a process that's going to ad help them to adapt more efficiently in the future with greater levels of potential. So I think rather than uh, giving an actual question that way, I mean, the other thing, I guess, if you're looking at questions is coming to mind now is what's going to help open up the horizon for them is what do you foresee in the future? That type of a question. And can you describe health to me? And then, you know, most people can tell you what they don't want, but they can't tell you what they do want. Sure. And so then they might be stuck. And then you ask them another question. So how does a healthy person sleep? How does a healthy person eat? How does a healthy person move? What would that look like? What kind of relationships do healthy people have? Are they perfect? You know, um, and the, the idea with that is to get them to start thinking about health as being a much bigger model than just the physical form, which is the effect of everything else going on. And it's so true. And really, the truth is we're just trying to have them step across that ledge step across that hump right some people see it as big like you might have saw this as a huge thing and and yet others you know are able to step across it but there's something else that they have to move through and boom once they do it's kind of like oh my god it's like all the you know and it's really what it's about and it is the aha that allows people to keep moving right Tell me, Absolutely. we talked about, I, I brought up the word alphabet soup because, you know, I know that there's, you know, acronyms and alphabets and stuff. 
Tell me your latest. All right. Well, I have two A's, three B's, four C's and five D's. We may not get through all of this, but anyways, <laughs> that's fine. I'll, I'll rattle them all out and then we can play. So the Please. two A's for people to think about is acknowledge and alignment. The three B's is be brief, be brilliant and be gone. The- <laughs> be gone. Be gone. I love that. That means I love that. <laughs> the four, the four C's competence, confidence, calibration, and consistency. And the five D's are do dump, delegate, delay, and donate. <laughs> I, love it. I love it. Pick one of the A's. Okay. Let's do alignment. Cause I think that's the easiest thing. Um, so again, if we're looking at alignment, it's alignment in making sure that we are aligned in the right space in the right present, being in the right present time consciousness when we are with another individual, because in that moment, that's the most important person in the world to you, to you, and you are to them and ensuring that we are in alignment within ourselves so that we're coherent with our heart, which creates coherence in the brain. So that's how I would look at alignment that way. Love it. Give me a B. B, brilliant. (laughs) Brilliance is not about the being the smartest person in the world. It's about being using the alignment in the present time and allowing yourself to be an open vessel to allow things to flow through you. So an example of that would be how many times have chiropractors had something just instantly come to them out of the blue have no idea where it's come from and they ask the question to the patient and boom that solves the problem or you know you're palpating and you're like what is going on here and you know all of a sudden that patient connects everything so that's what i mean by being brilliant in the moment i love it give me a c Ooh, um consistency i think i'll pick and that is again do what you say, say what you do, being consistent, owning up that if you're going to change some things around or you've been thrown for a loop, own up to it and move forward from there. So an example would be is when I have a patient that I'm going on, you know, one perspective with them, but I might have something else in the back of my mind. And I get to a point saying, you know what, I need to move back over this way. But I've already had that conversation with them. So I am consistent in what I've um, what I've described to them. So that again, that way that people know what to expect in general, know what to expect yeah. from you. Yeah. Especially with being a facilitator of health, right? It's so yes. important for them to know that, right? Know what the expectation is, right? Good. Give me a D. I'm giving you two dump and delegate <laughs> delegate because I think it's really hard for us doctors to not to, to, to delegate. Uh, we tend to want to control everything. And I think that what we need to recognize is for us to honor our biggest passions first and allow other people to, Uh, do what their passions and their strengths may be. And then um, dump is get rid of the stuff that you're not using, get rid of it. If it's in an email and you have looked at it and it's sitting there, dump it. If you're not going to do something with it or you're going to delay it with it, then just get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. And dump old thoughts as well. So it comes in many forms. I love it. I love it. You know, you talked about, Oh man, I mean, we could dive into this stuff, but I love that. I love what you just, you know, I just love it. I love what you just said. Liz, I have a question for you. Where do you see your future? What's your future look like for you? I have no idea. This is a really interesting time for me. And what I will say is that I am moving in this direction where it's really about in, uh, as long as I'm experiencing joy and freedom and vitality and love and presence and grace, things open up. And so I'm sort of wiggling around. So I have this practice, I'm doing some speaking, I'm writing some stuff for a book, and I've got all sorts of things that I'm sort of doodling on. And I'm really enjoying being with five grandkids while they're all little. And that's been just such a gift. So it's very, very interesting for me. I'm saying I'm surrendering to the moment. And this is really interesting because my past Liz was always about being that driver and knowing exactly where I was going to be and trying to control everything around it. And then it's like, no, let's just go into the complete, not complete opposite, but a general different place. (laughs) No, I love it. I love it. And if I was to ask you, and I'm not looking for the box, believe me, I do not want the label. I don't want the box, but 10 years from now, 
Uh, I would say 10, 10 years from now, I'm, I'm a human being walking this uh, third rock from the sun. Good. I love it. I love it. As you are nine years from now, eight, seven, as you are right now, you know, it's so beautiful, you know, just to be able to evolve like that and really just kind of be open to whatever, whatever is there. You know, I, I think that, I think we live our lives best when we're open and that, you know, because you know what? So much passes us by when we're closed. Like, you know, living life in blind ears, we don't see anything right over here because we're only looking here. And there's so much of this world, you know, so much of life to experience, you know, that, that, that we don't even, we, we're only tasting one, one, one thing instead of seeing the whole smorgasbord of life. And I so honor you, Liz, for, for, for opening yourself up to the, you know, to life. And I know that's, that's who you are. I know innately, you know, you are inquisitive, you are a discoverer, you know, and also, you know, you're, you're triumphant, you know? And, um, you know, when I look at you and I hear the story about your amputation, it's like, it's Liz. So it's like, you know, you know, but it, it, it that doesn't minimize you know, all the things that we feel, because if we don't feel it, there's so many people who live their life like boom, 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 boom. And they never feel a thing. So they don't cry and they don't have sorrow and they don't get to laugh. And they, you know, it's just like, you know, and I just, that's what I, that's what I love about you, that you take all this in and you just live it. So thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I mean, yeah, we're so much more than a body part. We're so much more than our story. And I think you had said it right on is to stay open, stay curious, be adaptive, um, and sometimes slow down to see more, yeah. really. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Liz Anderson Peacock. Liz, thank you. Thank you for being on the leadership line. Um, you know, it's, it's just amazing. I can't wait to see you in August, you know, at the wave. Uh, we are going to be rocking the house. It's going to be unbelievable. I don't know if you know this, but it is free. I'm not charging anybody anything to attend. You know, I want to make this a homecoming that people can come to the last couple of years where we got cut off from it, you know, and we had to go online. We're I'm just I'm taking all barriers. Come, you know, people on license renewal. There's two different packages, sixty nine dollars, ninety nine dollars, nothing. But to come and be present nothing, right? No registration fee whatsoever, because it's time that we celebrate. We celebrate life. We celebrate love. We celebrate chiropractic. And it wouldn't be a celebration without you there. So that's why I'm so thrilled that you're going to be with us. So thanks for being with us uh, and on our leadership line. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. And to our viewers, Thank you, man. Thank you for for coming back week after week, listening to, you know, we drop this leadership line every other week. Um, thank you for, for, for listening every the opposite two weeks. Always we drop a life, uh, life by life West. Um, and you just constantly are listening. Our viewers, our views are growing uh, because you keep spreading this. So keep spreading this. There was messages that Liz taught us today that there's somebody who's just waiting to hear. They don't have to be a chiropractor. It might be your spouse, your significant other, your child, whoever, you know, and and your CA, it doesn't matter. You know, just spread the message uh, that people are bigger than, you know, they were ever led to believe and that the potential is unlimited and it is unlimited. So until we come at you again, uh, we'll bid you adieu. And um, from Dr. Liz Anderson Peacock in Barrie, Ontario, and from Ron Oberstein sitting here at Life Chiropractic College West in Hayward, California. Uh, May your lives be sweet. May the people around you experience sweetness and may everything you do bring joy to others so that people can start living their full expression. Okay. Till we meet again, we'll see you later. 